Good evening, everyone. I am Chauncea. This is episode 12 of May I Offer You a Different Perspective. And I have three beautiful women with me this evening. I have Sybil, Tia, and Queenie Vibe. And um, Queenie and Tia, actually, we met for uh, during a... Um, a training for another organization that we facilitate youth groups. Um, and then Sybil was referred to us. Um, and I think she is also a great addition to the conversation that we're going to be having about youth engagement and youth uh, issues. And so I'm going to introduce, introduce, excuse me, each of the ladies, and you're going to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. I'm going to go ahead and start with Sybil, since you're right next to me. Go ahead. <laughs> tell us, tell everybody what you do. Well, good evening. My name is Sybil Makel. I'm a speech language pathologist. I work with children and adults that have communication disorders, um, specifically in the areas of articulation, language. Um, pragmatic language, which is also social skills, and oral facial myology. Tia. Hi, I'm Tia Myers. I'm a licensed therapist for the state of Maryland. I also work with children and adults, and recently just really focusing on the adolescent population. And Queenie. Uh, I'm Queen Mobley. Um, I'm a peer recovery specialist at the Point Beyond Adolescent Clubhouse of Calvert. Um, I work with teens from the ages of 12 to 18. Um, I also am in progress of being a substitute teacher for St. Mary's County. And I own my own skate team um, here in Southern Maryland. Um, and we reach uh, all three counties in Southern Maryland, Charles, St. Mary's, and Calvert. Okay, thank you guys. I forgot to mention that Tia and Queenie and myself, the organization that we uh, work with and, and facilitate group youth groups with is called Gals League. So if you are interest, interested, excuse me, in um, pairing up and reaching out and learning more about the that organization, I will leave the details for that organization in the uh, video details. So let's go ahead and get started. So I wanted to speak with these ladies because uh, first of all, I, my business, um, Infinite Direction, I created a workbook for youth ages 16 to 21 that just basically gives a um, step-by-step process of how to initiate a successful career journey. And so just pairing up again with Girls League or Gals League rather, um, it allowed me to uh, make um, connections in the community and which we serve, which is the youth group and youth issues. So this uh, episode 12, we're gonna be talking about that um, audio issue. So let's talk about some, um, some some issues that we have as far as in the uh, in the youth community. What starting with Sybil, what um, encouraged you to start working with youth? How did you know? Or what transpired in your life to say, "Okay, I want to work with you." Well, obviously, you know those wonderful teachers and educators. Oh, really bad audio. I'll put when you on mute. Okay. Um, obviously, those wonderful educators and teachers that I've encountered along the way um, from elementary school all the way through college really made a difference in my life, um, not only just teaching me the things I needed to know, but also just being there outside of being my teacher. So that was um, an amazing experience that I will never forget. I think that has helped shape me into who I am. And so as I've worked as a SLP, I have seen the need for that. So I've just decided to really focus on kids, um, specifically adolescents um, who need my services um, and who need to really work on just that extra, that extra having their arms, having your arms wrapped around them as along the way, along their journey. So that's kind of brought me to this point in my career. Okay, so as a, a speech pathologist, what does a typical day, and you don't have to get all into the details, 
But <laughs> what does a typical day of working with a youth look like for you? Because, I mean, why would a youth come to see you? Well, again, as I mentioned, mentioning those communication disorders is one thing that I really focus on. But since we're really talking about uh, communication, I'm really focusing on pragmatic language and just giving them the skills and techniques that are needed to communicate and express themselves and have conflict resolution strategies when those problems occur, whether it be with peers, whether it be with parents or other adults. And sometimes um, the need to teach that skill and what to look for and how to read the room and read those verbal cues and nonverbal cues are really warranted right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think just because there's so many other external factors that uh, the youth are exposed to. Um, and sometimes I feel like that piece really needs a little bit of extra attention. Now, Tia, you also, um, you say you work with adults and I'm trying to unmute you as well. So, oh, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> okay, uh, you work with adult um, and youth as well. So what perspective do you come from? as I'm um, doing the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, um, to go back to your question, what kind of led me into working with youth? So I always liked kids. Um, and so I, I really didn't know what it looked like to be able to work with kids. I thought it always looked like being a teacher and I did not want to do that. Um, and then, you know, also I like, you know, being able to be yourself and speak your mind and come with that authenticity that I think is important for kids to see didn't really fit for me within the school system. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, it wasn't until I had my own kids, um, specifically my oldest, um, and seeing, uh, kind of the struggle that he went through, uh, when he went to middle school. Um, he was told by his, you know, middle school principal that he was worthless and he would be nothing but what? end up in jail. Um, yeah, in middle school. And so that kind of, that was difficult. He struggled all through middle school, even in high school from that, um, because, you know, the principal looked like him. And so that was kind of disappointing for him. And so, Doing damage control for that kind of inspired me to kind of start a mentoring program, which I started like five or six years ago. And then from that, it, I, it kind of led me into doing this youth development work um, mm -hmm. and working at the clubhouse. And I, I absolutely love it. You know, you get the opportunity to just make an impact on that, that crucial age group. 12 to 18, you mm -hmm. know, where if you don't have someone that's speaking positively into your life, um, in that moment, it, it, it can make or break them. Um, yeah. And so that's what we try to do at the clubhouse, you know, kind of be that other adult figure um, that can kind of help them make better decisions and kind of help them get on the right path if they're not already on that path already. So, yeah. Now, Queenie, you come from a totally different perspective. So go ahead and share <laughs> with everybody your previous youth experience. Like what encouraged you to work with the youth? Can you remember this? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. All right. So um, I started working with infants and toddlers as a nanny and a caregiver and mm -hmm. watching them grow into that, you know, middle school and then eventually like high school age, I was like, wow, it is very different than, you know, caring for a baby or a toddler, you know, like you're essentially giving them the skills to, you know, do things for themselves and kind of letting go a little bit. Mm -hmm. And not always, you know, giving them the answers for everything, kind of letting them figure it out. So I, you know, thought that was really cool. And I wanted to expand on that. Um, and plus, um, around kids and, you know, when I wasn't at work, because I skateboard and, you know, skateboarding is a wide range of ages, um, you know, from literally three years old, all the way up to 75 plus, like they're, 
it's crazy. So I'm around kids all the time and I wanted to, you know, do that, you know, full time, work with teens and adolescents and even in my spare time mentor a lot of the kids that were skating because there is a stigma behind skateboarding that, you know, you got to be drinking or smoking or Mm -hmm. whatever be cool and then go do some rad stuff down a stair set and I really wanted to kind of like wait whoa time out you don't have to you don't have to do the stuff that they're doing on the videos and stuff like that you can have a clean wholesome life but still do really really crazy stuff with the skateboard because that ultimately is the craziest thing you're ever going to do like put the drugs aside put all that crap aside and just focus on the crazy stuff you can do on your board and, you know, I bring a little bit of that um, to the clubhouse as well. Some of them are interested in learning how to skate or already know how to skate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played basketball, too. So, again, that's another age range where obviously you can go from really, really young to, you know, you know, old head. But the kids that come to the clubhouse, you know, a lot of them really love basketball. And, you know, I played basketball with um with grown men because I was a part of the Nicolette Summer League and I was the only girl playing. Um, but they really gave me some game and taught me a lot. And I just take that with me and teach it, you know, to the younger kids, you know, like being the only girl out there, they don't care that I'm the only girl out there. When you're on the court, you're a baller. So I try to like give that mentality, you know, to the youth that come to the clubhouse, like whatever else is going on in your life, it doesn't matter when you're on this court because you're a baller. So yeah, that's what encouraged me to want to work with the youth. So talk a little bit about how did you, what piqued your interest in skating? Because, you know, you're a woman of color, a woman at that. So what got you interested in skating? Um, Honestly, it was um, seeing women in the professional skateboarding realm actually succeed and you know, they're having their own, they're having their own pro model boards. They have their own pro model shoes. They are skating these very, very high ranked contests and they're winning, you know, um, there are so many women of color who are pro in skateboarding now. And yes. And when I was coming up, you know, a lot of them, you know, were, you know, a little, a little bit older, like 25, 30. Um, and then maybe like a couple years later, a younger generation just started to sweep through. And a lot of them were from Japan, Brazil, um, you know, just from different countries, but they are still people of color. And it was like really, really cool to see that, you know, not just American women were, you know, doing so well in skateboarding that there were different ethnicities and different cultures coming into skateboarding and just dominating it and I was like that that speaks to me right there because you know I didn't see any other girls like me Mm. skating in my community I was the only one you know skating with the boys when I went to just skate down the street from my house and then when I realized that we had a skate park near my house it was just so intimidating because there's just nothing but dudes there um Mm. predominantly white men And I was like, I do not belong here. But I kind of uh, just had to really shake that mentality off and Mm -hmm. just kind of just bust through the door and just be like, all right, I'm here. Um, So what did that, when you say shake that mentality, what, Um, if you could put, uh, identify what that mentality is, what would you say that it was, that was holding you back or that was creating that fear for you? Um, I I guess it was just a lot of people around me that were melanated saying, oh, you're doing that white people stuff. And Mm -hmm. I I didn't understand what that meant. And I kind of still don't like I don't understand what that means. Like, you know, that demographic isn't the only demographic that skates. So I don't know what you're talking about. Like there are like so many black professional skateboarders that just are so good, but still so very humble and still, you know, tap into, you know, the fact that they're going to be sometimes the only person in that space, but to actually use that to their advantage to shine, you know, like if I'm going to be the only melanated person in the building right now, skating or at the park or wherever I'm at, 
I'm going to shine. I'm going to do tricks that maybe somebody, nobody else is really doing. And, you know, just taking that and kind of applying it in my own life and seeing them do it. Like even black men um, in the professional skateboarding world, being the only black men skating certain things, like hearing their stories, watching their interviews, um, watching how their progression came about really, really helped me kind of like shake that comment of, oh, you're, you're doing that white people stuff. It really like just seeing other black people talk about the same things that I was feeling inside and mentally um, really helped me kind of go to my local park and really be a part of that, you know, skate culture even though I was the only woman and still the only woman really at the park that skates consistently. I just remember those interviews of other black women and men. And I just remember what they've been saying and what they're still saying now and just kind of take that to heart and um, just continue to do what I do. And sometimes it does get hard, but I do have, you know, women friends, they live in DC and Baltimore, but mm -hmm. it is worth a two hour drive to go spend the whole day with them to skate, just to be around people that look like me. It's, it's, it's so worth it. So you and Tia, you guys host or facilitate the clubhouse. And uh, Sybil, you can hop in too. My, my question to you is because you touched on something about giving youth, um, allowing them to be comfortable to know that they have a voice. And I know Sybil, you come from a, um, a background of, teaching them how to use their words. So just to answer that question, how do you um, encourage them to be able to speak up and talk about what's going on with them and, you know, uh, self-esteem as well. So I'll give you guys the floor to talk about that. Okay, well, typically, I mean, I, I do have a primary goal of we work on certain and objectives, but I also set the tone that my space is a safe space and I have an open door policy um, to be here if needed, you know, for whatever it may be. Um, so I set that standard from the very beginning. Um, a lot of times we look at various scenarios um, mm -hmm. and we talk about solutions to those scenarios. So the light is not shined on them in that moment so they don't feel like they're the target of the discussion. Um, but we talk about other things. And so what could you do and how could you handle that? And what could you say? And so when you take the spotlight off of them, I find that they're a little bit more open mm -hmm. to talk about issues that they may encounter or their friends may have encountered or things that may be going on at home. And then somehow I kind of circle back around at some point when they're open and receptive, may not be in that moment, maybe a few conversations later. And then we kind of talk about and analyze and dissect well, what, what could you have done differently? And how do you think that sounds? And so it doesn't come from a place of judgment, but mm -hmm. it's, oh, we're just talking. And then if it's appropriate, I may share something about myself um, and a personal experience. So I find that the dialogue flows a whole lot more freely and they're not looking at me as a speech language pathologist, but, oh, she's someone I can talk to. Mm -hmm. So um, I set the tone, I set the standard, I let them know I have an open door policy and it just kind of flows from there as the situation presents itself. Tia? Yeah, so I mean, along the same lines as what Sybil was saying, you know, first and foremost, making sure they, that there's a safe space um, and that they feel comfortable um, in that space. And I think too, um, even with the clubhouse and in a therapeutic relationship, you know, building that trust is, also important you know so many kids come from so many different backgrounds where they've been you know disappointed let down uh, used and abused and mm -hmm. so coming into new environments where they don't really know anyone it's really important that they kind of build that trust um, for people and then once they feel safe and they have that trust um, I think we still give them the room to connect more so with their peers than with us. And we kind of facilitate through our group, through our activities and workshops, we want to facilitate them being able to uh, build those healthy relationships with their peers. And 
uh, try to remain in the background as much as I can um, and then mm. step in um, when necessary, you know, outside of modeling the behavior we want them to have. We also want them to kind of, you know, create their own space so safe and trust adults, but also, you know, be comfortable around their peers because at the end of the day, these the peers are who they're going to have to interact with, you know, when they become adults, you mm-hmm. know, not us, you know, because they are the future. Um, so, Queen, I'll let you speak more to that. Yeah, so um, just to expand on that more, um, definitely giving them an opportunity to just have their own group and, you know, come together on their own um, and just giving them the power themselves to communicate with each other. um, We do um, peer mediation. Um, A few of them have been trained on how to mediate. Um, so if there is conflict, they can sit down in a quiet space with the two people who are in conflict and one, you know, mutual person who's going to sit there and just listen um, and help them help themselves solve the problem. So that way they're not always depending on an adult to solve problems for them or to come break things up like uh, in the near future, I hope that if there is ever a conflict, um, that they can, that they won't need me to come intervene all the time. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, like I said, they play a lot of basketball here, and you know, with with boys, it can get really, really heated. You know, they get really competitive, and you know, sometimes some of the things that they've been going through come out on the court. And I really want them to be a team and pull each other to the side and be like, yo, what you did or said wasn't cool. And like, just relax. We're out here playing basketball, you know, and if you can't handle it, we're just going to sub you out. You know, I want them to feel like they're powerful enough to, you know, check themselves and then, you know, kind of check each other, especially our older high school um, students who really try to empower them as much as possible because at the end of the day like when they graduate you know i'm not going to be there to be like hey what are you doing why are you doing that you shouldn't be talking to somebody like that you know what i mean like yeah i'm not going to be there always you know like of course right now i'm going to be here for you if you have an issue absolutely holla at me because i don't want you out here thinking that i'm not going to help you just because i'm not going to solve your problem but you have the power at the end of the day. You are a powerful human being. And, you know, we're trying to instill that in them. And some of them are still new. So, you know, some of them, you know, probably don't feel like they have the seniority to check other members. But as time goes on, as more that, that they keep coming, I hope that they feel empowered enough to check themselves. Like, am I good right now? Yeah, all right, then let me go check my homie who just, you know, did an illegal screen and, you know, got mouthy with somebody when it wasn't even necessary, you know? So that way I don't have to come down there, blow the whistle, flag them down, like, what are you doing? You know, like, just really trying to get them um, to empower each other, you know? So as we are empowering them, get them to empower each other and help each other out. And, you know, not always look for an adult to solve their issues. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, when we get too old or we're just not around, you're going to have to, you're going to have to, you know, knuckle up and really use these skills that we've been giving you here to help your, help your neighbor, help the people that you're around, help your coworkers eventually, you know. So you're having some feedback. I don't know if you, if you go on mute and come back off. I'm going to put you on mute and I'm going to ask my next question. So you guys touched on something that's really, really good because um, over the summer, my son and I, we went to, I think I told you this story before, we went to uh, a Mochella event that was in the city. Uh, it was a go-go event. And um there was a used uh, a brawl, put it like that. <laughs> and one of the, by the end of the evening, one of the young men he um, ended up losing his life up there. But that 
goes into my next question. How do we, and Queenie, you touched on it, but how do we encourage um, conflict resolution amongst the youth so that we can, uh, I guess, curb the violence issue? Another um, situation that happened was I used to host the accountability, an accountability call. And one of the women on the call was disturbed because she had just a few minutes before the meeting, a friend of her daughter's had, had, had got killed, you know, in, in an incident and come to find out he was, um, he had some uh, understanding issues. I, I don't want, I don't know the co politically correct term, but um and so I don't think that sometimes that we don't know what's going on with other people, like this, their situation and stuff. So to encourage conversation and conflict resolution instead of violence, how can we do that in our community with the youth? And so anybody can answer. Well, I think first we have to model it ourselves at being the older generation and presumably wiser, I think we have to model what we want, the behavior that we want to see, you know, in these youth, we have a lot of adults who are struggling, right, and, you know, cutting up out in the streets, you know, and they, they're not <laughs> modeling the behavior, you know, that we want to pass on um, to our youth, and I think uh, that's one, two, it's, you know, not having the knowledge and the resources to get help you know asking for help for the age group that we work with is a is a big deal you know mm -hmm. um it's not easy for them to ask for help um and then often when they do need help um they don't know where to go um or they do go to a place for help and you know they're told to either suck it up or you know it's not that big of a deal um and so you know asking for help um modeling the behavior that we want to see i think are, are are really important um in you know especially having the resources um to kind of direct our our youth to to get the help that they need they may need in dealing with some of these mental health issues and anger issues you know some kids are just angry right mm -hmm. and the yeah. only way they see to resolve these problems is, you know, through violence. Um, and so seeing things being handled a different way um, is something that I think has been a constant struggle, you know, um, particularly in, in, in our culture. Um, mm -hmm. Often it's, let's handle this, you know, through violence. Back in my day, it was like, let's settle it with our fists. You're right. <laughs> let's do this out you know right a, the consequence of that is some bumps and bruises but now right. that's gone to you know the gun violence yeah right um and so when does it end right and so i think as as a culture we have to really take a look and and see what we need to do to kind of break that cycle um and not always look outside of that um, externally um, to blame. Um, yeah, we have so, a lot of accountability that we need to kind of own up to ourselves. So breaking the cycle, what does that look like in practice? I know you say model the behavior, right? But I know my son to come out here and say something that'll just be like, hold on, wait a minute. <laughs> so how can, what is that communication, you know, as far as breaking the cycle? What does breaking that look like in practice? I mean, we in the moment, like, oh, <laughs> okay. so, so how do we address, how do we deal with that in practice? Breaking the cycle can look like, you know, when I was younger, I got beat, you know, with the belt. You know, today the law is, you know, child abuse. Right, um, right, right. And my parents were like, I don't care, call the police. Right. But breaking the cycle is, you know, actually, when we know better, we do better. Yeah. Right. And so education first. Right. Um, we get angry. We do what we know. Right. Mm -hmm. And so our go to is what we know. We beat. 
right? Yeah. Punish. Um, and so as we learn to do better, we know that, you know, we don't have conversations when we're angry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we take a breather, we walk away, and then we come back. We don't hold on to it, right? Mm -hmm. We come back, we talk about it, right? And modeling those things are, are basic, right? And so we have people who they get angry, they're, they're taught to handle the anger and violence, yeah. right? Rather than to sit down and talk it out or express how they were hurt or how the behavior affected them. And so breaking that cycle of being able to communicate in anger and, and work it through, I think is really important. Yeah, spanking kids up. and beating yeah. kids and then turn around and then expect for them not to express that same level of frustration. I, I get it, yeah, with others yeah. when they don't. <laughs> yeah. That's my perspective on, you know, just one thing that you can do to kind of break that cycle of, of yeah. violence or acting in anger in, in a negative way. Yeah. Queenie or Sybil, y'all have any answers? I, I agree completely with Tia. Um, modeling is huge, but you know, as she was talking, I was thinking, let's start early. Let's not wait till they're between 12 and 18. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to implement those skills and techniques that we made should have been teaching since they were toddlers, you know, of mm -hmm. course, on our level. Um, you may not have everything you want. Sometimes you will hear the word no. And let's talk about how you deal with that as they continue to grow. Of course, kids cry, they tantrum, they melt down all of that comes along with it. But when they come out of that moment, let's communicate with them on their level, like, okay, how are you feeling? Whether we pull out some emojis and we may turn it into a lesson or how else can we deal with that? Um, and as we progress, then let's talk about, let's self-analyze where you are. How are you feeling right now? And let's acknowledge your emotions and your feelings. Are you angry? Are you upset? Are you whatever it might be? Yeah. Okay, so what do you do when you're feeling like that? And it may be something different for everyone, but I think part of our responsibility is helping them to tap into that, to give you some strategies, what works for you. Some people like to listen to music. Some people like to journal. Some people like to, to walk or whatever your thing might be. And, and depending upon where you are, you may need to have a toolbox of things to help you through those moments, right? I mean, that's just reality, right? Even us as adults mm -hmm. on this call, we all have our things that we need when we're having a moment, right? So once we acknowledge that, make them aware of it, um, teach them to kind of focus on that, decompress, and then let's come back and talk about what do we need to do in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Even take it a step further, let's talk about the consequences of your choices. Right. Yeah, that's a big one. That's huge. And maybe again, not so much you in that moment, because I know when your emotions are running high and you're upset, you're not receptive, right? But that goes back to the piece, as I was mentioning earlier, take the spotlight off of you or off of them per se. And let's look at some hypothetical real life situations. And so I think when they're able to do that, they can come up with solutions and really kind of analyze and dissect Oh, well, maybe that's not a good choice, or maybe I should do something differently. And then again, ultimately teaching the skill, okay, when you're in this situation, what are you going to do? Yeah. And then once they get to that point and we can build on it, you know, role playing, right? Let's make it as real as possible. Let's do some role playing situations. You're in it. What are you going to do? And so my therapist hat kind of changes to real life and I push, right? Because that's real life, right? This person may not back down. This person may uh, instigate the situation or their external factors coming into the situation. What are you going to do? And so I think it makes it more real because it's like, oh, well, I didn't think about that. Or maybe I should do this. So I think there's so many different pieces to this as we talk about conflict resolution, as we talk about consequences to your actions. Uh, some, you know, might be a quick consequence and some could be life changing. And so you yeah. really have to, you know, ask yourself, do I really want to go down this route? Because once I'm here, that's it. I, I can't pull myself back. But I think it's important for, for kids and people in general just to kind of know where you are in terms of your, you know, what zone are you in? You know, how are you feeling? Can you recognize that? You know, and so I, I, I think that takes 
um, just kind of knowing yourself and learning yourself to be able to recognize that and then go from there. And, and it may not always be pretty. That's just reality, right? Yeah. But to be able to set the tone and the stage to know that this is a safe place to say, I'm not in a good space. I don't feel like making good decisions. I want to do A, B, and C. And no, I'm not going to be judged or ridiculed for it, right? Because in one moment we're teaching and we're modeling, but I'm still trying to create this safe space. So those are just a few, few ideas that you know we could do to try and deal with conflict resolution. Yeah. So yeah. Queenie can Sybil, she come from the safe space perspective. Queenie <laughs> come here and we in the clubhouse. Ain't no we outside, ain't no safe space. <laughs> you want to add to that? Sure. Um so yeah, um, I just try to, you know, just hold them accountable, you know, because, you know, some of them have expressed that their parents do hold them accountable physically. And I'm trying to like, you know, just change their minds about that, like being held accountable verbally mm -hmm. is, that's what it takes to, you know, be a human being, you know, like, we're not, we're not on naked and afraid where we gotta fight for our food and fight for <laughs> water and fight for you know we're human beings and we live in a civilized society so therefore we have to handle our problems hold other people accountable in a civilized manner that's going to be respectful that's going to you know not mentally harm you later down the line um and so where you feel good about yourself at the end of it all, like even if you did mess up, even if you did do something wrong, you're you're still a human being at the end of the day, and you you have to you have to like realize that you did something wrong in the most humane way possible, just so that way you can carry that with you as you do get older, and you know like physical violence is never really the answer now if somebody comes and clocks you on the side of the head with a wooden beam then okay like all right all right i don't know if, if words are gonna do anything <laughs> there but when are you ever really gonna be facing that situation where somebody's coming at you and literally trying to harm you a lot of the times it's misplaced anger if somebody is trying to start an altercation with you that is still, there's still a way to have a conversation and talk that out. It doesn't always have to result in the physical. You can have a conversation and be articulate. Oh, uh, I think it's in the, I think it's in the office or it's in the game room. Okay. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, so um, just getting them to understand that not every problem or every like inter like negative interaction with somebody has to end in hands and feet. Mm -hmm. You can have an intellectual conversation with somebody and squash the beef, or you know maybe y'all won't be friends, but at least you'll be cordial. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. It's just it's just getting them to understand like when you have to use violence for every single negative interaction or confrontation are you really are you really doing it in an intelligent manner like you got, at the end of the day these are very bright intelligent kids and i'm trying to get them to tap into that and also understand that you can solve your issues by being bright and intelligent yeah. you know like just just getting them to understand that, you know, some of our parents, you know, like it's ingrained in them that using the belt is going to, you know, get the child to act right. But generational, yeah. Generational curse, as they say. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. really have to do the work on why that is a generational thing. I mean, I'm not going to dive deep into that because that's a rabbit hole on itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can dive. Oh my there goodness. is something in place there that our great great grandparents or grandparents our parents you know it was just instilled into them that that is the way to get somebody to do what you want them to do and that's mm -hmm. you know do I necessarily want them to do what I want them to do or do I want them to see that there is an issue that they can solve 
by being accountable for it, having a conversation, understanding that there is going to be consequences. Sorry about it. And you can still, we can still have a smile on our faces at the end of that conversation. Like if a kiddo gets in trouble at the clubhouse, you know, in that moment, I'm looking at them like, you know, because I want them to understand that, you know, you you kind of deterred my spirit right now. I'm a little upset. Yeah. But I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to berate you. I'm just going to have a serious look on my face. I'm going to ask you if you really understand the rules, reiterate the rules again, maybe take some of your monetary ACH bucks away, write you a little note on why and give you a chance to at least earn those back, you know, because there is redemption, you know, like letting them know that there is redemption when you do something wrong. Like, it is not just the end all be all to violence. You said something really powerful there, bring me back to when we talked about this last time to you, you know, being a mother myself, you know, I didn't pop the kid (laughs) too. But um, I remember it was one particular incident and after I, I looked at my son and I was like, oh, I will never spank my kids again. And the reason why I say in particular my son is because it, for me, it was a level of de- demasculation that I had. It just hit me. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, no, I, I can't, you know, so... For for me, I, I that was a, mo- a defining moment for me with my my younger one. I said, you know what, I'm going to take the no spanking um, yeah. route, and not to say he don't be trying it, but um, <laughs> you know, having that level of self control to say, you know what, uh, you know what you did, what you do that, what, why you do that, and and to encourage the conversation for him to open up instead of immediately just going to hitting. Absolutely. Yeah, especially with the the men. Just think about it. I mean, like I said, you know, we're hitting them and then telling them, don't you go hit. That is like, how does that fit make sense? (laughs) Exactly. And when you talk about emasculating, you know, our young boys um, through the physical Mm. um, punishment, you talk about how you see so many young black men out there committing these crimes right and a lot of it is for lack of respect yeah right yeah at some point in time or somewhere along the line they maybe weren't feeling respected you Mm -hmm. know as a young black man right in their circumstances or in their environment whatever happened I think respect is so key, you know, not just for our young black boys, but boys in general, right? And I think often as moms, we forget that they are men, Mm -hmm. right? Um, We're caretakers of them, but they're going to grow up to be men, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they need to have, they need to know that they can have a certain level of respect from an early age and demand a certain level of respect by a woman yeah Mm -hmm. exactly and then that ties that ties in with identity something civil mentioned earlier you know learning who you are there's a lot of kids who who don't know who they are right Mm. and the way that they're learning who they are is in the street right i can you know i'm gonna make a name for myself because i'm gonna earn the respect through you know joining joining a gang right Mm. committing the crime or disrespecting women right and so learning who you are is so key you know in forming that healthy identity and then at that point you know maybe they're maybe better able to handle conflict and make better decisions but the respecting is uh, an issue yeah you know because it's generational you know generation after generation you're told that you're not a respected person in this country right that you you are not equal um and you don't deserve to be here that sits you know in the soul of so many young black men and women um Mm -hmm. but the young black men especially yeah trying to find your place yeah Mm -hmm. and if i could just 
piggyback on that. I agree with Tia, but I think it's also important to pour into our, our boys and our men early on, you mm -hmm. know, um, affirmations or speaking praise and, you know, positive reinforcements are just maybe sitting around the dinner table and that individual is the highlight of the, t of the dinner and you tell them the things that make them great. So they can start to hear it and believe it and own it and walk in it, not in arrogance, but again, just knowing who you are, which you contribute to this world and who you can be. And so I think if we could do things like that, hopefully it will combat some of the other external factors and the other pressures that come with this life that they may encounter and that in those moments, oh, let me remember who I am. Yeah. I'm a young king. I can do great things. I make a difference. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but I think we as adults and mentors, we need to help kind of drown out some of the other noise that they hear and no. just pour into them and love on them and help them know that about themselves until they believe it. And then they can also model that for someone else who may not be in that space, right? Yeah. Um, and it could be something as small as you're an amazing artist, you're an amazing singer, you're an amazing baller or skateboarder or whatever your thing is, but to help them to recognize their gifts and talents um, as they walk on this journey in life that, you know, I am somebody, I'm, I'm important and I'm not just this one mistake. So I think that is, you know, another technique and a strategy that we could definitely use to make a difference and kind of combat some of those not so positive thoughts or even not so many positive experiences, mm -hmm. um, you know, as we, as they think about who they are, as they continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, you guys brought up some perfect um, examples and Sybil, you brought up uh, affirmations. So amongst the three of you ladies, let's talk about some self-esteem building exercises when it comes to the youth, because we want them to grow up knowing that they can do all things and develop that motivated mindset. So what are some exercises as parents, mentors, facilitators, teachers that we can do to kind of encourage self, uh, positive self-image and self-esteem? So um, at the clubhouse, um, I have the kids do a self-esteem journal. Um, oh, I like that. I like that. And, oh. Yeah. And so it's tailored. Um, it's Monday through Friday. And mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just one sheet. And I usually uh, just have them keep it in their folders for the week. And then at the end of the week, I'll take them out, read them, and then put another self-esteem journal in. And some of them have... Um, questions like uh, something I did well today, um, mm -hmm. someone that I was thankful for, uh, a, a class that I think I did well in, um, you know, just getting them to say and think positive things about themselves. Um, as you can see, there's like sticky notes all over. Mm -hmm. This is where we do the, the gals lead. And this is them putting positive affirmations about leadership you know, so that way, every time they come in, they're seeing positive things there. And then we're talking about positive things and then uh, just getting them to understand that, you know, there are going to be times where your self-esteem isn't going to be at an all time high. But let's talk about why yeah. it's it's at the level that it's at. And let's think of some 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 solutions that can make you feel better. Um, uh, sometimes, like, you know, I'm around people so much that I just need, you know, time to just be by myself and kind of refuel that self-esteem tank. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have to, you have to do that on your own. You can't look for it in other people all the time. Like it's okay to have your friends and your homies, you know, you know, pat you in the back and have your back. But sometimes you got to look in the mirror and be like, yo, you're, you're the bee's knees. You're, you are it, you know? And they get so down on themselves and so hard on themselves when they fail that they think that that failure defines everything about them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't get hung up on one failure because you are a human being and you're going to be living for X amount of years. Failure is going to be a part of Very the experience. Part. 
yeah, it's going to be a part of the experience. But knowing that you have support systems and that you have yourself, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have mm -hmm. yourself and you have to trust yourself to speak positive things into your life. And I always tell them, food is more than just what you eat. Food is what you listen to. Mm -hmm. Food is what you're watching. And food is definitely the things that are coming in, out of your mouth and, the, and what's coming out of the people that you're around's mouth. Mm -hmm. And I really try to get them to understand that. So when they do hear negative things, that they don't just take it in and feed their spirit that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I learned um, a, tech, a technique a few years ago um, that I needed to use on my own kids. And it was mm. just, you know, from the very time that they're little, whenever they do something, you know, as a parent, you're always saying, oh, you did such a great job. You know, that was awesome. But um, just switching your words to you should be proud of yourself right, mm. um, is kind of helping them to internally be proud of what they've done and accomplished, even if it's just a finger painting or, you know, they tied their shoes because now they, they're, they're learning to depend on their own appraisal of themselves versus always looking for mom, dad, grandma, or auntie to give them that affirmation that they did well, right? Mm -hmm. And so now as they get older, they're not running to look for that affirmation. They already have it, right? Because mm -hmm. you've taught them, you should be proud of yourself, you know, and of what you did, right? And you can still be proud, just teaching them to, to find that internal um appreciation for themselves I think is really key and take and ownership it sounds yeah. like when you put the you on it you you allowing for them to take ownership yeah mm -hmm. yep and I would also just add to that reflect on the great things that you've done right sometimes we're so busy or wanting to achieve the next goal or you know as she said maybe not in a good place in that moment sometimes you have to teach them to take a look at what they've accomplished and the great things they've done and to remember what you've done and continue to celebrate that so that you know that you have um, the foundational tools and, and strategies to be able to continue to be successful, even if it may not be your best moment. So don't forget those accomplishments and those great things that you've done. And so it, it's not being arrogant, but sometimes you just got to pour into yourself and celebrate yourself and know that you are great. And so reflecting on those things I think are key and hopefully can help help them get through the process of maybe not having a great moment a little bit faster and not staying in that place because hey I have done this I have done that this was great you know or, or whatever it might be or just looking at where you've come from to where you are now you may not be at the finish line but I have made progress so I think it's important to look at that piece um, as well as you're focusing on what's next and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Okay, so this is the question I've been waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting, waiting to ask, to ask. Because of course we are here in the state of Maryland and um, we have our first black governor. And not only that, we also now, it, Recreational use of marijuana is now legal for ages 21 and up. Now, <laughs> I personally do not care for this um, particular uh, approval or grant or, you know, allowing, you know, or making it legal. Um, and I'll get into my personal views in a second because I want to touch on a show that I saw on Netflix. But um, I just want to talk about, since this is a very hot button topic because you have, it's also associated with the legal system, with the decriminalization and, um, you know, the medical community with not wanting, you know, uh, pain, um, living with pain. And so I think that it is a very fine line. 
So because we all deal with youth in some um, facet, what are your thoughts on the decriminalization of marijuana? And I'll start with Sybil. <laughs> she like, girl, you don't put me on the phone. Okay, so I, I'm not really sure how to answer that, but I do think something does need to be done about the legal piece and um, people that look like you and I who are still in jail for the same thing that is now legal. Um, so I think that issue needs to be addressed definitely um, on the legal from the legal standpoint. Medically, um, you know, people have medical issues. They've some people have experienced prescription drugs and all that comes with it and the side effects and the other issues that come with it. So in that aspect, yes, if that is you and you know, you know what you've done and what you're dealing with, then please, by all means, do what you need to do. Um, as far as our kids, though, I'm, I'm a little, I, I am concerned, right? So dealing with um, conflict resolution or your emotions or just escaping, you know, are we opening up another door for them to go to um, and giving them more access. You know, some of our kids look very mature for their age or how hard is it to get a fake ID or whatever it might be. Um, or maybe even if they're seeing adults in their home do this, right? To, to cope and deal with the, the stress of day to day. So I'm, I, I do hear your concern about that. And I, I think as a, an adult, as someone who works with kids, we just really need to talk about um, some of the risk involved. Um, we also need to talk about maybe some of the long-term effects and maybe even share some stories that I know you shared with me before um, that could possibly happen. But more importantly, we really got to work on those strategies and techniques on dealing with life. Yeah, life. Yeah, and life different, right? We really have to push that, push that, push that. Like that needs to be the forefront of everything we do and start early, 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 early. You know, like I said, even from when they're, they're babies and toddlers. It's not always going to go your way. So how are we going to deal with that, right? Yeah. Um, you you can't always go to marijuana, marijuana or alcohol or whatever your thing is to deal with life, you know? And so it is my hope and prayer that we equip our kids and even our adults um, with the strategies and techniques needed to deal with the life and even model it for them and put some boundaries in place that that's not the go-to um, when things get hard and difficult. Yeah, so for me, um, I, I did vote to, you know, pass that law. And yeah, I am a director of the substance use prevention program. But the reason why, yeah, the reason why our program exists is because I, I feel like there's more dollars put into uh, reactive programs, right? After they started at marijuana, they progressed to heroin and cocaine mm -hmm. and whatever else. Now let's give these programs, you know, millions of dollars to kind of clean up the mess, right? Mm -hmm. and, and why not refocus that money down, you know, elementary age, you know, teaching them some of the techniques, refusal skills, and coping mechanisms that Sybil's talking about from an early age, right, and being more proactive so that when they are 21, they are using it recreationally, right, versus to cope and deal with some of the stressors that they weren't able to learn skills to cope with early on in life. Find recreation. <laughs> <laughs> recreation, recreation. Yeah. I'm like Queenie because she she said something. I'm gonna bring it up there, but you know, as far as like uh, the skating, then you know, you get you know, puff puff fast and y'all then skate, bust your face all up. You know, Queenie, what's your viewpoint on it before I just jump in there? Sure. Okay. So, um, as someone who did use marijuana chronically and not recreationally to escape from my issues. Um, you know, now that I'm sober, I understand like 
why they would want to legalize it for a medical standpoint and for recreational use because alcohol kills Mm -hmm. millions of people a year. And that, and people don't like, they think of alcohol as just, I don't know, like Listerine, like it's not even a drug. Like when you think of drugs, you think of weed, you think of cocaine, you think of psychedelics and stuff like that. But a lot of the times people are, you know, don't think of alcohol as the same. And I think weed is on the, you know, marijuana is on the rise to how Mm -hmm. alcohol Mm -hmm. is, you know, like the average soccer mom is definitely having a glass of wine after (laughs) she done took all the kids to practice. The cleats are all dirty and leaving. And the husband's like, where's my dinner? Uh, now she's my having, life. Mm. She is having a glass of wine and nobody better ever tell her, you're doing drugs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what I say. I'm going to wait until the end because that was my life. Yeah, go ahead. Bye. <laughs> and that's, and that's kind of how I think of it as an adult using mm-hmm. it recreationally. You know, it's the end of the day. It's like a glass of wine, you know what I'm saying? Especially if you don't have any plans on driving for the rest of the night, because if you do drive while you are high off marijuana, it is a DWI, driving while impaired. Just like if you have that glass of wine and then you go to the store real quick and a police officer pulls you over and smell, it is a DUI. So, you know, like recreational means in the safety and confinement of your home, like there should be there is no need to have your car smelling like that going places. There's no need for you to be smelling like that going into Walmart, got, buying toilet paper. Nobody needs to know that that is your recreational habit of choice at the end of the day, you know? Um, and as far as kids, they're going to think of it like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they're going to think it's so cool because, yeah, weed's legal. So now I get to know you're still a child. You're still a child. You are not 21. You can't vape. You cannot smoke marijuana. You cannot drink alcohol. You're not an adult. You know what I'm saying? It is for adults. And honestly, um, when it comes to the stigma of skateboarders, like marijuana and like skateboarding are like that. But like Mm -hmm. now that I'm like way older and I have a different view on certain things, I cannot skate and and no I cannot I just can't do it one there's already a factor of I do not wear a helmet and pads when I skate because I'm a street skater Mm -hmm. usually the helmet and the pads are for people who are skating those crazy ramps and the bowls and stuff like that and I'm thinking about my physical wellness and health and fitness at the same time even though it is an unconventional sport I'm still working out my legs and my abs and my core and everything like that Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be so in tune with that if I go smoke a blunt with with the homies and then try to come back and skate like I'm it's just not going to be I'm not going to be right I'm going to get hurt and it's kind of like just it's kind of like a DWI driving while impaired skating while impaired like I don't want to I can already get hurt doing this sober. So why would I, you know, try to, no, like I, no. So, and that's what I try to tell some of these young kids that come to the park and I see them with vapes. I actually confiscated one from one of the little dudes uh, at the park the other day. I saw him in there and I know the boy is only 15. And I said, come on, vape, what are you doing? Do you want me to jack you up in front of every, no, give me that. I'm sorry, Queenie. (laughs) And, you know, and it was just like, listen, I'm not mad at you because you know what? I was out here doing the same thing. I only got on you in that split second because I know the harms that it is doing to your brain. And I already know that you're smoking marijuana because I saw you in your little Instagram story doing it. And it's just like, like after you finish your line or, you know, your skate line, come talk to me about what's going on with you. And it turns out, there was a lot going on at home. Um, mom suffers from substance abuse and keeps all that stuff in the house. And it was very easily accessible. And she doesn't realize that it's gone half the time because she can't remember where she placed it and la da 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 da. And it was just so easy and accessible for him to have this. And I was like, all right, you know, so we had a whole conversation and, you know, I've been tapping in with him um, here and there. And, you know, if he can stay on, a good path, you know, I'll think about putting him on the team. Cause I told him, I was like, Hey, you know that I put 
people of your age and your stature on my team, people who might not have the best home life and can't get skate gear like that. I'm looking out for y'all, you know? So if you, for the rest of this school year, I don't hear or see you doing the bit because I have the other older guys look at you too when you're at the park because they're going to know if you come in here blaze, they're going to know and they're going to tell me and just holding them accountable so that way they have something to look forward to. Like, oh, if I'm not high when I show up to that park, if I'm not vaping when I show up to that park, Queenie's going to put me on the skate team. Like mm -hmm. that that's big for them, you know, to be a part of a skate team, to be able to get skate gear for free, like that is a big deal for an average skateboarder because that stuff is very expensive. And, you know, it, so legalizing it recreationally, it does, it does give me a little bit of anxiety for these kids, but we as adults have to educate them on why it is solely for adults and for people who need it medically. You cannot just be out here smelling like that. You're going to get hemmed up. And the next thing you know, is going to be DG, DJS, yep. social ser service, you know, and it's going to be a lot of drama for just one little bud of, of weed. Wait until you are at 21 to when you have the coping skills, mm -hmm. when you can actually be a functional adult with a job, with a job, with a driver's mm -hmm. license, and just a recreational activity or a hobby that you can do when you are upset, when you are mad, so that way you're not just going straight to the bleezies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like the please. Like you're not, you're not Snoop Dogg. You're not Wiz Khalifa. Calm down. Right. Calm down. You are gonna have the rest of your life to smoke a little bit of herb, and I promise you, after a, a long, hard day of work okay when you are old enough to partake okay because I can't get mad at them for wanting to do it when they are an adult when I I was doing it when I was way younger than 21 and everybody else is doing it I was 21 I was doing it. you know like I can't get mad at them I can't point the finger but I can encourage them to have some abstinence and just wait you know like just the same thing that they teach about having sex yeah just wait until you can have the coping skills to deal with all the stuff that that pertains and that comes with because because it comes with a lot that's why it's for for adults mm. you know just getting them to understand like just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right for you and especially if you're getting it off the street you don't know who put whatever in it you don't know what strain it is you don't even know if you have anxiety or or, or whatever or not and then you hit some of this weed that's uh, indica or sativa and then you're supposed to be on the sativa but you did an indica now you can't move <laughs> and, you know like you have to educate yourself about these things because it's, it is a plant at the end of the day it goes it grows from the ground and if you're going to be putting it and ingesting it in your body I want to I want a five page report on <laughs> I, I want info from you like that you know what you're you know what you're getting yourself into because I mean, even at 21, your brain is still not developed. So I want you to wait even longer after you're 21. Like, <laughs> right. You're 35. Yes. Yes. 35. <laughs> Did y'all want to add something to that before I go into my little story? No? Okay. So I have found myself in the um, offenders meeting, and that's not anything that I did of my own, doing, uh, you know, but just being in a community um, and sitting back, having a business, trying to see how, you know, you can help. And so you're in this meeting and everybody in here is, you know, everybody's supposed to be there, put it like that. And the coordinator or the liaison is talking about um, all of the edibles in the elementary schools and the middle schools that the children have been bringing from home. And this is the medical grade marijuana. That Queenie, you just said hit the nail right on the head where you're talking about the parents um, leaving stuff unattended. Even if they putting it up, kids, I, I, let me tell you something about these new kids. They are very intelligent. <laughs> they know when mm -hmm. mama and daddy tapped out and they ain't really paying attention and stuff is left um, 
exposed or easily attainable. And so um, I think that it's, it opens the door for not far past recreation. Mm-hmm. And one of the things for me is see, weed was never really my thing. <laughs> my thing was alcohol. And so like you said, after work, you know, you I'm, you know, doing my mommy thing and winding down and I got to have my wine because the kids is getting on. It was my coping thing. And so for me, I never knew when I went from it being a recreational thing, recreational now, because mm-hmm. it's a social thing, to it being I have I needing to have, I'm needing to have a drink every day. I never knew when I crossed that line. And so to put that amount of responsibility on a youth to recognize when they have crossed a line to it being something for fun and recreation to something where you have developed a dependency. And I think that it's kind of irresponsible to a degree to label it as recreational. Because when I hear the word recreational, I'm thinking we about to go have fun. I'm thinking we about to go play some basketball. I mean, you know, recreation, like a team, like we about to go do something productive. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, substance abuse and and getting high and, you know, what rocket ships are being built that way. I mean, that's (laughs) that's just not, to me, that. It's giving a label to something that is detrimental with labeling it as something recreational and fun. And, you know, so that, you know, that's my issue with it. I see the other side of it when you're talking about the youth because it is, it's finding its way into the elementary schools. And it doesn't look like what it used to look like. It looks like Fruity Pebbles. It looks like candy. It's 10 times stronger than the stuff that, you know, you can buy on the street because it's medical grade. So that said, I do not know if you guys had watched, it was a documentary that had came out on Netflix um, in 2020, and it's called The Pharmacist. Y'all have not seen that. I suggest you check that out. I've seen it. Girl, let me tell you. So, first of all, it starts, for those who have not seen it, it starts off with a pharmacist telling his story of how he lost his son to substance abuse. He had got addicted to pills, and it spun into a full-blown heroin addiction. And during his investigation, he finds, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens in between, you know, as far as like the uh, DEA, all the drug enforcement I mean, it it turned into a full-blown investigation that really the pharmacist spearheaded because he was just so dedicated to finding out who was prescribing these pills because it was not only him that was getting these prescriptions, it was other local pharmacists that were filling, you know, fulfilling these prescriptions and come to find out at the, by the end of the investigation, that it was a black woman who mm-hmm. had a facility in another state that was open. I mean, it'd be three, four o'clock in the morning and people were lined up outside to get prescriptions from this, from this woman. And I'm gonna tell you how karma works. She ended up getting in a really bad car accident And she ended up getting addicted to the very same pills that she was prescribing for these people that was like addicted. And I, and so I say all that to say is we are recovering as a community and I'm just not talking about black community, um, all many different types of communities that are struck by substance abuse. And I'm just like, where are we going with um, like you said, just opening up the door for our coping skills to be attached to a substance instead of learning to work through our issues. And so I just feel like it's just a recurring issue that just never gets solved because we are taught not to deal with our problems. Don't talk about it and 
you know, and so that is where I come from, from that perspective, when it comes to um, the recreational part. Yeah. So I say all that I mean, say, oh, go ahead, because I might. I was going to say, if we how do we noticed, deal with that in our community? So go ahead. No, I was going to say, if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of dispensaries that have been popping up oh, everywhere, yes. Yes. and we don't own those. And so the beneficiary of this law being passed is not the Black community, mm -hmm. right? We may be partaking in the dispensary, right? But we're not benefiting from the sale of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you think of why these laws are being passed, think, just keep in mind that there are going to be a lot of rich people after marijuana is legalized in the state of Maryland. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, as long as somebody's pockets are being fed, mm -hmm. they have no reason to keep it off the shelf. I mean, and that's the same with any opiate type drug and with marijuana as well. They see that, you know, the, the people, um, a are going to get it one way or the other so yeah. why not capitalize mm -hmm. off of that so mm -hmm. you know we live america is a market it's one big market and that's just that's just the way that it is mm -hmm. but within that market there is education and prevention and clubhouses and youth centers and stuff like that that educate young people on this market that we live in um, because they're going to be faced with it. Yeah. No matter how timid we are about what's getting passed in the laws, no matter what we think or feel, they're going to be faced with these things. And what we can really do is just educate ourselves and then educate them. So that way, when they do get faced with opportunities to do some of these substances, when they are a youth, when they are grown, they have the skills to know what level that they are on. Um, I'm a teenager right now, no. Uh, Queenie would definitely be on me if, you know, and I try to get them to use me as an excuse to like, you know, like, you no, know, my counselor, absolutely not. And some, of, I know that some of them have, because they've told me, I'm like, oh yeah, somebody asked me to go vape in the classroom, uh, go vape in the bathroom, but I, then I said, no, I'm going to the youth center later. Queenie's gonna know. <laughs> and they're like, who's Queenie? So, like, even that, who's, who's the, who's even that it's still like that seed being planted is still good because if, I mean, even if it's not me myself, it gives me something else to look up to, you know, to to have better decision making. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And so it, for me, the issue is not that the laws are being passed to legalize it. It's how as a society are we pouring into the kids and educating them about not to use substances as a youth, right? And giving them those coping skills. Yeah, but the other side of that is, and we, I think Sybil mentioned it earlier about the outside stuff. And you know, when they're teenagers, they're so influenced by the outside stuff. So it's mm -hmm. so difficult to get through to them in a home environment. Um, teachers, it's difficult to get them to, to you know, um, to grab hold of that concept because it's the peer group, it's the, the other industries, you know, the music industry, um, social media, let's not even get on, on that beast yeah. by itself. So how do you, how do you, you know, be able to, to reach them? I think we need more resources, right? More money, more, more programs, more options to combat everything you just said, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they can see that they have options and that's not the first option. And just like uh, certain individuals that Queenie has mentioned that make it look cool or like the thing to do. We need those same type of individuals with that star power, if you will, or the, or the people the, ki um, the kids look up to and emulate mm -hmm. who aren't making those decisions. Hey, let me show you what I'm doing. Let me show you what 
you know, making good decisions looks like or not using recreational substances look like. And I, I'm still successful. Let me show you the things I've been able to accomplish by not choosing to go down that path, not in a sense to bash someone that may choose to do that, but we just need to have that same um, level of examples available to kids, to youth, and maybe even some adults that people they aspire to be or that yeah. they look up to to say, hey, this is another option. You know, I'm not throwing shade to this person, but let me show you um, my success story and my accomplishments and the things I'm doing just to kind of combat that. So it, it can be just as appealing to go left versus as it is to go right. Um, I think we just need more of that and even just starting in our community. So it doesn't have to be that well-known celebrity. I was just about to say that. that was on my mind. Yeah. Even in our community, you know, those individuals that are doing well and it, it may be the doctor or the lawyer or the physician, or it could just, it could be someone else who's just making a difference in the community. You know, yeah. what are you doing to make a difference? It could be that mom whose kid was impacted, unfortunately, by substance abuse or addiction. And now she's out here trying to make a difference. So no other kid has to deal with what her child experienced or no other mom, right? So I think we need everyone from all aspects to kind of jump into this and make a difference um, for these kids and even adults and even families and parents um, to kind of combat uh, this, this yeah, to combat, you know, the desire to want to use substances. Yeah. Because I think now we just taught to idolize like the people that have money and status. And what about the, the person next door that's just doing so much in a community that's just, it goes, right. you know, it goes unnoticed um, or unrecognized um, to a certain degree. Yeah. 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 We just that's talked about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Girls, we're like, who are the leaders that you look up to? And I swear there was, they didn't know. Yeah. Right? And then when they mentioned it, it was like J. Cole and uh, mm -hmm. who else? Taylor Swift and I'm NBA Youngboy. Oh, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and so influenced by like uh, hip hop, like yeah. culture. Mm. And like I, I, I can attest to that because like Dr. Dre's The Chronic, I was like, yo, I cannot wait till I'm able to drive and smoke while I'm driving down the street real slow with my music. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah, it was and like, mafia back in my you know, I'm, getting, three things. Next thing you know, I'm getting pulled over and my car smells like dick, and I'm like, I'm freaking out now that now all that Dr. Dre shit is out the door. Yeah. <laughs> I, get real I got flashing lights in my rear view now. It's real now. So it's like getting them to understand like that that whole lifestyle and that whole culture yeah. works for them because the police officers are on their payroll. You do not have officers on your payroll. Dr. Dre, has, like when he goes places, he has to, the, the police barracks that he's going to be near, they have to know that, oh, Dr. Dre or Snoop Dogg is going to be in town. So they can, in case anything goes down, those officers can escort him in and out of whatever. That's right. not the same situation for you. So yes, Snoop Dogg is going to be able to have flashing lights in front and back of him while he's smoking. You cannot, you are not, it, no, no, that's not, it's not <laughs> the same like for that. you. Yeah. <laughs> but they are so influenced by this culture because now these, you know, rappers are so accessible because of Instagram yeah. and social media and YouTube like literally they can just go and see what they're doing at a drop of a dime because they're posting it on their stories mm -hmm. you know they're posting pounds of weed in their stuff and of course they're not getting in trouble for it but that's because the police officers are on their payroll to protect them when they go in and out of cities that is not the same for you it's not the same for you you are an individual a regular person I, I don't know what else to tell you. Like if you go around smelling like that and your vehicle smells like that, that is cause for them to search your vehicle. Mm -hmm. And now you're in the car crying on the side of the road, crying because two, three more officers got to come and search your stuff. And if you lie and say you won't got nothing in there and they find it, you're going to jail. Snoop Dogg's not going to jail for having pounds of weed on him. He's, he's Snoop Dogg. 
he's somebody is on his payroll somebody is getting paid to protect him it's not the same for you we are regular human beings you can't take that culture and apply it to your life in that way you have to understand that there's a reason why they're promoting this and it's all for money publicity, yeah. publicity and fame it's not it, it's not to it, it, and it's honestly to make you kind of feel bad like oh why can't i do this why can't i do that he's doing it he's doing it blah, blah, blah. now yeah, we want to go that. Post you get that it's the, everybody else is doing it instagram yeah, it, yeah. so yeah. <sighs> it's a lot yeah i think we also need to teach oh. that I'm sorry. I think we also need to teach that social media is a moment in time and an image that that person who's controlling the narrative wants you to believe. And yes, to some that to great some degree, that may be their true narrative, right? Yeah. But that's just a moment in time. That's not forever and every day, right? That's not all day. I mean, maybe in some cases it could be true if you're at that status, but in in actuality, it's a moment in time. It's what they want you to believe. Anyone could take a picture or post something or have a background to make you believe this is their reality. And we know most of the time that's not the case. And so yeah. I think yeah. we need to somehow teach, model, explain uh, what reality is and what it is not. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, reality for Calvert County is, is definitely uh, not the reality in other counties. <laughs> Exactly. Or uh, uh, South Central or Beverly Hills. <laughs> exactly. or, you know, yeah. Uh, what was I about to say? Um, yeah, because, you know, um, one of the shows that I used to love to look at was Unsung. And they go and they talk about the backstories of what was really going on in these people's lives at the time. And it's like, no, I mean, yeah, they was doing it, but the, the turmoil that was going on behind the scenes, you don't hear about those stories mm -hmm. until like 20 years later, and then you look at them, you know, down the line, and you're like, dang, you know. They were dealing with a lot. You know, yeah. Houston died of a drug overdose, you know. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, painkillers, Prince, painkillers, so many, you know, of those you know, famous people, you know, in the spotlight, it was good, but behind the scenes, they were struggling, you know, mm -hmm. so it goes back to, you know, teaching these kids really how to be resilient, right? Mm -hmm. um, there, we see kids, one little thing happens, and, you know, they're done, right? And so how do we begin to, to, to teach them how to be resilient and kind of get through the tough times because mm -hmm. we, we all know those are going to come right 100 percent guaranteed so what does that look like encouraging because i don't want to you know leave that topic off on a sour note and just stick with the issues like i know for me i do talk to my kids about you know like first of all and that may not be a, a good approach but i do let them know how much i do not like it <laughs> like don't don't do that don't, you know but i know when they leave the door they leave my presence um my voice is probably the last voice that they hear at the time but um i i, I do let them know it's like you know that's not something that um you should do i don't think it's a good decision it inhibits you know i just talk about all the things that is bad about it that's my approach like i said it may not be the most effective approach but um what are some techniques some tools that could probably help me um, you know, and when talking to my kids about um, abstinence and drug use and, and um, decision making. Um, I would, I mean, I've gotten the kids um, to do like a certain workshop and it's called Music, Mike and Beats. Okay. And that's when we, um, we'll listen to a song. Uh, well, first we'll read the lyrics and then they'll tell me if it's negative or a positive, if it's going to be upbeat or if it's going to be kind of laid back and slow. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'll try to get them to like, you know, 
get a sense of the song before it even starts playing. Um, and we listened to a song by Tupac, uh, So Many Tears. And mm -hmm. it's talking about, you know, being in the streets, um, drugs, you know, losing very close friends to either drugs or gang violence and stuff like that. And then, you know, I play the song and like, you could tell that they were like, dang, like, yeah, very, very heavy and actually a great idea and, and very intense. And, and then I'll play another one and it'll be like something that's completely like to the left of Tupac with like some Frank Sinatra or some Nat mm -hmm. King Cole or something like that. And then ha again, have them read the lyrics, positive or negative, and then we'll listen to it and, you know, compare and contrast the genre mm -hmm. why you know like why some like and then and, and we'll do like modern music that they listen to right now yeah and i'm like y'all really listening to music that's pr promoting heavy xanax use yeah <sighs> like the other day i went down to the basketball court to just shoot around with them and you know they had some music on and i was listening to it like the first song that they played was fine completely fine whatever and then this other song comes on and it's talking about taking a handful of Xanax. And I said, whoa, whoever is playing this music, you got to turn this off right now. I cannot, in good faith, shoot a basketball and be around y'all while a song about Xanax is in my ear. I Y'all throwing me off, please. Mm. And that thing off. is just music. I'm like, yeah. 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 But I'm like, I'm a very avid listener of music. Like I really listen to the lyrics and that's, you know, kudos to my mom. She used to be a DJ. And she oh, was, really? That's know, interesting. Yeah, okay. She lived in, yeah, she lived in DC like my entire adolescent life. So she was always doing shows, you know, DJing for some very prominent people in hip hop that were speaking conscious in, in mm. making conscious hip hop music not the music that is going on today. I don't even consider the music that they listen to today hip hop because it's just not like, it's just- Mumbo. It, they call it with the mumbo rap, the new stuff and mumbo is, rap, yeah. Yeah, and then I'm trying to get them to understand like, why do you think some of these people lose their life hmm. doing some of the things that they didn't even need to be doing? Like uh, the one guy, Takeoff, lost his life at a gambling uh, game thing or whatever. It was a, like a private gambling game. Like, why does he need to be? Yeah, the situation. Gambling doesn't he make millions and millions of dollars? What are you gambling for? You know, like why are you? Me. You know, like why are you in the position? Like, granted, he didn't get into a fight with anybody and lost his life. He was hit by a stray bullet, and it's just like, but why put yourself in this position to where you're gonna be around people who don't love, care, or respect you? And I try to keep that those three things very prominent. Are you in a space where people love you? Mm. Are you in a space where people respect you? Are you in a space where people care about you? And if, like it's me, and if, and if all three aren't popping up, it's time to go. Yeah. And it's just I like, like yeah, and I really try to get them to understand, like, a lot of these people can't not be in a space where they shouldn't be because of the industry that they're in because of the nature of the culture. If you're going to be, you know, doing the hip hop rap thing right now, you're gonna have to put your, yourself in some very not so great places, but that's the name of the culture. You have to be there so that way we can get pictures of it. So that way we can promote it. That way we can put it out there and make even more millions off of just your image of you being at a gambling spot or you being in the club with a whole bunch of hoes and, yeah, all this crazy, crazy yeah. stuff, and and it's just it, it's just like, but are you gonna see, um, are you gonna see uh, Taylor Swift in some gambling? No, she's not gonna be in a space where she's not supposed to be in. That's not the nature of her culture. That's not the nature of the culture of the music genre of music that she's in. She's going to be at the Balenciaga buying some whatever the heck, or she's going to be at the some like high-end store buying some sh shorts and <laughs> stuff. She's not going to be in a position to where, you know, but it's only in that 
hip hop culture where we're promoting sex, we're promoting alcohol, we're promoting drugs, we're promoting, you know, all this promiscuous behavior and everything like that. And we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that you're seen in these places where you really don't need to be in because you have so much publicity and fame and money, you don't even need to be in these spaces, but because you are in this culture, you are going to go there your handlers are going to send you there because it's it's a good Instagram picture. It's a good in the moment, you know, type of feed, but you're not going to see any other artists who do any other genre in these kind of spaces at all. You're just not like, mm-hmm. and we have to educate them. Like the music that you're really listening to is really feeding your psyche and really feeding you. Like, and you're going to think that it's okay to take a handful of pills when you're feeling really low one day because little Zan and little Peep said it was cool. <laughs> yeah, you really have to get the um, the image versus reality thing like out really out in the forefront. Like it, it, if that's not what it really is, that's, that's, that's an image. Like <laughs> you have a real life, you know, mm-hmm. that you have to live, yeah. Yeah, I was watching a documentary and it was about uh, Mac Miller and he lost his life to um, yeah. an overdose. And um, he was in the studio with French Montana and he was filling his cup up with lean. And French is, you know, trying to tell him, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. But the way he's saying it, he's laughing, he's giggling, he key key in. And it's like, if you seriously don't want someone to partake in these things, why are you laughing? What's funny? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, why do you think this is funny right now? Like, if this is, if you really think that he should not take this or take as much as he's taking, there should be no laughing. There should be no kicking. You need to be taking it very, very serious. And it's just like, I try to reiterate that to the kids. Like, if you see your friend going down a path, the way you, the way that your stance is, the way that your facial expressions are, the words that you're saying and the way that you say them mean a lot. If you're laughing and kicking along with them while they're using and you're trying to say things like, oh, stop, don't do it. But you're over there laughing and playing around. That's yeah, not going to work. That brings up another great question or a great point of, you know, the people that we choose to associate ourselves with and um, selecting friends. Like, the evidence how do you determine a good friend you know what I'm saying and like you just bringing up allowing certain stuff to take place when it's not healthy for you you know and you're just sitting back and letting it go on is that a friend is that someone you know that you want around you and then on top of that you know with the usage you you know you're drinking around people that you can't even leave your purse around I mean just stuff <laughs> like that like all that goes and you know into sound decision making I like that idea Queenie of um you know going through the the music checking out the lyrics and you know having the youth or the uh to determine whether that's healthy is it something that's uplifting is it something that is destructive are there any Sybil do you have any other um because you come from a the a different perspective over there uh <laughs> with the communication aspect um, I, I do. I, again, like I said, I mentioned the role playing piece, mm-hmm. but I also was thinking as Queenie was talking, you know, these people look up to these celebrities and, you know, all of this image, I think to some degree, we need to talk about the things that aren't so good. So for those individuals who don't have those success stories or those individuals that have lost their lives, like, let me show you what the opposite of that looks like. Right. right. Um, I guess in facilitating that conversation, um, obviously, you know, with parental permission is definitely needed because some of them can be very harsh. Um, But let me show you what it looks like when it's not fun anymore, right? And so I think if we share that information in a way that they can understand, but also drives home the point, hopefully it will counter some of that. Mm-hmm. Because all they see is the, the glitz and the glam and it's, you know, I'm having a good time or, you know, they're having a good time. And so let me show you what it looks like when the lights are out and when they're at home and struggling. So you mentioned unsung or maybe even some of those 
rappers that they they emulate who have been in the news for not making good decisions and now they're in court right or now they have to hire I'm seriously in, yeah. in all honesty they have to hire lawyers because of whatever may be happening I, I don't want to celebrate and highlight someone's downfall but I think we really need to show them in a way that they can really that they can relate to and the people they emulate, hey, this is real, right? Yeah. You see Instagram, Instagram says this, but guess what? From this state, so-and-so was in court because of X, Y, and Z. And this is reality. I mean, I hate to be so, um, you know, forceful with it, but I mean, I think we have to just present that image as well so they can see it, right? Um, and really know what it looks like from the same people that you're out here emulating and idolizing and wanting to be and, and trying to live the lifestyle that they live it's not always, you know, as good as it looks. Yeah. So I think, you know, sometimes talking about the things that aren't so great um, while we're talking about self-esteem and conflict resolution, but we also need to show, you know, the not so good side of it um, and, and show them what it looks like. And I think uh, recently I heard an artist talk about, um, you know, when he was in hip hop at a younger age and mm -hmm wanting to be in those settings and that. And here he is 50 years old talking about, I thought the same way, I wanted to do the same thing, but now I'm here and I see that's not wise. I think if they step up and really talk about their reality and we present that to our kids, that I think it would make a difference to hear it from their mouths and not just ours. Yeah, see you. Uh, yeah, for me, um, just going back to I don't know I'm I'm traditional you know going back to values yeah morals yeah. and principles I mean Queen and I say it all the time at the talk about that morals values and principles the MVP right where are they you know it's almost like those things are you know rare you know within our kids you know um basic you know respect for others you know caring for one another, looking out for one another. It's, it's almost like we're fostering a generation of non-compassionate individuals, you know, who are very selfish, you know, I hate to say, and, you know, this is, this is what we're, we're kind of fostering. And, mm -hmm. and so it's a larger issue then Definitely. you know <laughs> a lot of people are ready to tackle you know we see it in the school system you know kids come back and teachers they i'm not saying they don't care um but it's a, clearly a difference in when you know i was growing up you know a teacher would take five minutes to stay after school to help a kid who needed help with homework nowadays you know when the kids leave the teachers are gone right yeah. um there is no additional help back to school um so i mean it really me it takes a village yeah, right you can't you can't say parents need you can't say teachers need you can't see, say coaches and everybody needs to kind of chip in and help build this future um of youth you know because otherwise we're in trouble yeah. right because if they're all smoking weed and doing whatever else you know who's going to be the leader of tomorrow <laughs> they're out there because i'm gonna say you there are some really they are. intelligent I mean, smart you know and I just, it's just we just want to continue to you know to foster that and to grow that and my son i look at my my little baby mm -hmm. and he's like in kindergarten and he's so excited about school and I'm like yes they like this you know like how do we keep them like with that you know being excited about life before things start happening and you know you start to take those hits you know the self-esteem and you start going down you know just I just want to just like what can I do I just want to keep them just like they're so innocent you know but um life is life and things happen and um I think it's important one of the things that I do like to share when I do interviews or when I'm talking about my business is like I just want people to know it's 
even if, you know, you tried it or whatever the case may be, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know what I'm saying? Life goes on. And like uh, Queen, you mentioned it earlier, trials and tribulations is just a very small part of your life. And, you know, it's just get up, dust yourself off and you keep on going. And, um, and so that's what I just, I just, I don't know. It's, I just look at the whole substance abuse of it as far as the recreation. It I just think it's a um a wolf in sheep's clothing clothing, excuse me, to term it that way. Okay. So since we talked about that, what are some resources? Because we all we always want to leave off help and on the helping hand note. So that if someone is struggling, um, a parent and or youth who is struggling with substance abuse or mental health or feel like they need an, um, an extra ear to listen and someone to talk to. Uh, Sybil, I know you have your own practice, if I'm saying it right. Tia, I know you do as well. Queen, you do a lot of facilitation and a lot of hands-on in the community as far as youth engagement. So if you guys want to just talk about your businesses, how you help, where you can be found, if you're accepting clients, I mean, however, whatever, if you got any initiatives that you have coming up. So you guys have the floor. Anybody can start. Um, I'll go first. So um, obviously for me, um, the clubhouse. If you're in Cal if your child is in Calvert County and is struggling with any of the things that we have mentioned tonight, um, the clubhouse is definitely one of the best resources um, to have you, you know your child in. And um, on the other end, if you're in St. Mary's, you know the SOMD OG Rollers, my skate team. Um, we try really hard to put the kids who come from broken homes and are suffering from substance use or if parent, their parents are suffering from substance use um, or if their parents are divorced or if they're just a troubled kid in general, um, we really try to predominantly look at those kids and put those kids on the team um, just so they feel like they have a sense of belonging. Um, they can come and talk to me at any time. Uh, we're not one of those skate teams that, you know, just looks at our DMs and kind of just ignores it. I try to answer every single DM. Um, I try to keep in touch with the community on a social media standpoint, but in a physical presence as well, throwing events. Okay. Yeah, throwing events at different parks. Um, we just did an event at White Plains. Um and it was one of the best skate contests that I've ever skated in and been a part of. It was, it was so cool. And I actually got to bring one of the little dudes that I mentor with me because he was having mm -hmm. a good week at school. Um, he's a part of a behavioral program called High Roads. And he struggles very, very hard um, because he comes from a very broken home. But uh, my wife used to um, be his teacher, but because he's in middle school now and she works with predominantly elementary school kids, um, okay. we, you know, he's not in the same school and she was just so worried that he wouldn't, you know, have anyone to really look after him. And I was like, I'll mentor him. He lived right up, he, he lives right up the street from us. Like it would be nothing for me to go get him, take him with me to the skate park while, you know, on the weekend or whatever. But I, I'm in touch with his teachers. Um, his teachers text me and let me know his daily report. So it's just like, you know, just being an, uh, an outside source with skating is like probably the best things that I could possibly do in the community. Um, mm -hmm. And just gearing it towards the youth, people of color, women, LGBTQ community, just so those people and the, predominantly the kids and the youth feel like they have a safe space to be. Um, there aren't too many, you know, LGBTQ skaters. Um, and the ones that I have come in contact with roller skate and I put them I on my skate. Like Y'all roller skate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, and they are, they are just so, they are so talented and just so good. And like one of our um, skateboarders, she lives in Brazil. And oh, wow. whenever she comes to America, I'll let her borrow one of my boards for however long she's here. And she's so, so good. 
Um, another one of my skaters, she's a roller skater and she's um, from Mexico and she is just really, really good. And then we have um, uh, a couple of young men uh, on our team uh, who are melanated young boys and their progression from when they first started on the team to now is just so good and they're just so creative. And I really just want to tap into that and just encourage them. Like when we went to the contest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my teammates were there and he's like 14. And, you know, I was like, yo, you got this trick. You know what I'm saying? Like, just mm -hmm. go for it. And everyone around us, like they heard me encouraging him and they encouraged him as well. And these are like his peers, kids who are like 14, 15, 16 year olds, years old, like, yeah, bro, you got it. Do it again. Do it again. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, and just being able to put his footage on the page for everyone to see his progression and everyone's just like, yeah, he killed it. And it, I know that boosts his morale. I know. Your and it was crazy. Media page. Yeah. And literally okay. the next day after the contest, and usually after a contest, Oh, you need to be in the bed because <laughs> you're so sore. But like, I was, st I still, I don't know. I still had a lot of energy. And then I go to the park and I see him there trying the same tricks he was trying. I was just like, so really? proud of him. Yeah, that's I what I'm saying. So it's just, they, these kids are so amazing. They are so talented. I think mentally they are so far ahead with the problem solving if it is nurtured. And I think that that's just, you know, we need to, to nurture that more, not the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a big nurturer because my background was with mm -hmm. the bait, with the infants and the babies and, you know, nannying. And that was my heart right there. Like, you know, like I, I know these are older kids. They're not babies. You know, they're not toddlers, but they still need someone to pat them on the back. They still need someone to, you know, dap them up every, you know, every time I see them just to know that the love is there and mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm not just, oh, I'm not just doing this for show. I'm not just doing this so, you know, the OG Rollers can be famous or whatever. I don't care about any of that. I just want y'all to have an opportunity to skate the way you want to skate, be yourselves and stay away from all the stuff that is stigmatized with skateboarding because that is not going to get, especially here in Southern Maryland, that's mm -hmm. not going to get any more parks built. That's not going to get the community to be behind us when we want to do events, when we want to raise money, when we want to do anything. We have to be clean cut people. We have to show that we are, some of them are, some of them are veterans. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are people who work in the medical field. Some, like, some people are engineers and programmers and they all skateboard. And it's not just a bunch of rowdy people just drinking and smoking and just being disrespectful and doing graffiti all over the place like we did an actual art project for the park uh you know a couple local artists um mm -hmm. the artists that i apprenticed for we got a letter to spell out the words nicolette and okay. we had a grand like showing of that and then we had the people who are the head of parks and rec come and show them that we can throw events appropriately that there is going to be none of this nonsense that you have probably seen and heard in movies and whatever the heck else mm -hmm. it's not like that like we really want y'all to understand that this is a resource for when we get too old and brittle to skate that these kids will take and pass the torch and do what we are doing so that is a good resource um, mm -hmm. for the community of all of southern maryland thank you see you no also, I mean, yes, I I do work at the clubhouse with Queen. That is an excellent resource, uh, especially in Calvert County. Um, we are one in 16 clubhouses in the state of Maryland, and we're very proud that we're the first clubhouse in Calvert County. Um, not only is it for substance use prevention, but it's also just a place where kids can learn how to, you know, build healthy relationships with their peers, learn some life skills, um, and kind of um, connect with one another in a positive um, mm -hmm. environment um, versus being home and doing whatever, um, and just not making very good use of your time. Um, and in addition to that, I do have a private practice. Um, it's 
by referral only right now. Okay. Um, there is a shortage of therapists in our county, um, which is unfortunate. Um, and so for me, it's the kids with the most need. And so mm -hmm. um, my referrals will come probably from the school, um, the counselors, um, um, in addition to the parents. Um, but that is another resource um, for Calvert County. Um, and then also another resource is the Calvert Mediation Center. Okay. Um, we partner with them as well. Um, they do a lot of conflict mediation training in the community. They do our training. Um, and I am also a trained mediator as well as queen. Um, we're mediators for Calvert County. And so we're in the fight, not to use the word fight for conflict <laughs> mediation, <laughs> um, but we want to help, you know, spread the word that, you know, there's better ways to resolve conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And and by talking it out, we can resolve a lot. Um, and so that's another huge re resource that I think is underutilized. Um, in Calvert County, especially within mm. the school where recently we have so many fights happening um, amongst young girls um, yeah. and a lot of the boys. Um, so those are just some resources here locally um, that I think are, are very helpful in kind of what we're dealing with in this county. And I also have a private practice here in Calvert County servicing Southern Maryland Therapy Work Solutions, um, as well as providing speech and language services. I do specialize in pragmatic language, so that's that social skills piece, mm -hmm. kind of resolution, um, trying to find different ways to solve problems, um, as well as oral facial myology. So I'm located here in Prince Frederick, but again, providing services to the Tri-County area. Wow, well, thank you ladies for joining me this evening. Look, it's almost nine o'clock. <laughs> you know, we could talk all day, but um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up because I want to be as respectful as possible uh, of you guys' time. I'm going to get some information from you ladies and I can include it in the details of this video here. I want to stop this, but you ladies hang on. But I just want to just in closing, thank you for everything that you do here in the state of Maryland. And uh, I will see you guys next episode. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.